Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me. My name is Adrienne Lickers. I am from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. I was actually born in the Western United States, personally. Um, I did live there for the first 10 years of my life, so I had a really diverse experience growing up. Um, my exposure to food and food security was not at all what my um, fellow students were when I moved first to the reserve. So when I was a kid, we grew everything that I ate. If we didn't grow it, we traded for it, or made some sort of bartering system with the neighbor. Um, we lived in a very small town in Oregon where there were uh, sheep farmers, cow farmers, pig farmers, um, really everything. There was almost anything you could hope for. We lived in a very uh, abundant valley and an hour from the ocean also. So lots of different things. Um, home of the steelhead, lots of salmon, lots of different fish. And I just thought those things were normal. Those were everyday parts of my life. And when I moved to Canada, I was almost 10 years old, and it was just the year before the Oka crisis happened. And one of the things that occurred was, during that crisis, which not everyone may know about, um, in Oka, Quebec, they actually brought in the Canadian Armed Forces because there was an armed standoff between the reserve and, well, at that point, the military. The, the town of Oka wanted to put in a golf course. And one of the things that they were doing was by blockading them onto their community, which is on an island, they were effectively eliminating their access to external food. And how many people have been to like No Frills or Freshco or the grocery store, right? In our community, we didn't have one. We hadn't had a grocery store since 1990. So in 2011, when the farmer's market started, I thought, it's time. We really need something. What actually had occurred was our program began as a result of the community saying, one of the things we'd love to see here is access to food. When you hear the words local food, how many people think, well, it was grown near here? How many people think, well, it was you know, sourced sustainably from a local supplier? That's a farmer's market local food. What was actually being requested was food that was local to their home. If you could bring in bread and vegetables for much less than the $1.85 per piece that you might get at the gas station across the street, that'd be great. Because right now if I want a tomato, I have to pay like $1.85. If I want a head of lettuce, we're looking at $2.50. And they only usually carry two or three of each one of those items because they don't really sell that well. If you want to spend $8 and get a box of cereal, I don't. I really don't want to spend eight dollars on a box of cereal, but that's what was available. So the farmer's market started that way. I went and I found farmers and I said, our community experiences food insecurity. And I finally met one farmer who was like, what is that anyway? And she was a lovely woman, had a hard time understanding me. To this day, she has the strongest of accents. And she said, if you pick it, I'll give you a deal on it. Sounded okay. So I went out and picked by the bushel peppers and tomatoes. I got a deal on squash and cabbage. And I went to the market and I set up my table, which could have been much bigger than this maybe. But I was the only vendor. Have you ever been to a new store where you're not really sure what it is and you don't know if they're going to stick around? Do you buy anything or do you just look the first couple times? Because for that first season, from probably July end of July until October. Um, I did a lot of showing off what I had. Don't you want to buy some? Anybody? Somebody? Nobody? I would put it in my car when it was over and drive around to people and make them buy stuff out of my car. It was like a, it was like a self-serve farmer's market at that point. So the market would run till 2 o'clock. I'd get in my car because I had an 83 Volkswagen Rabbit convertible. Now, you can't imagine, first of all, so there's a car with no power steering, full to the brim, vegetables. I would put the top down so that I didn't have to fight with it when I got to where I was going. And I would make people purchase things. Do you want some of this? And when it got really bad, I would just give it away. Please just take some of this off my hands. Because what was going to happen is at the end of the week, and at the end of that day, I would go home, I would take the produce, put it in my living room, turn the air conditioning up, and leave. 
Because I knew by Sunday night, most of what I had brought in the house, my mom would have frozen her can. And I don't, I, I didn't intend for it to be a make work project for my mom. What we actually were doing was that each weekend we would then preserve everything that we had left over. In many communities, and this is relatively universal, when something is new, there's an expectation it won't last. If something is too good to be true, do you expect it's not going to stay? It's too good to be true. So when people ask for local food, they wanted to see it, but they didn't really think it was going to work. They're like, well, I don't want to get used to it if I'm going to have to just go back to the store. Because in our community, one of the things that was happening is if it was a 25-minute drive from any given point on the reserve to the closest grocery store, which doesn't seem terrible if we're talking about like a $3 bus ride, but if we're talking like $40 or $50 to pay someone to take you, all of a sudden your, your grocery budget is quite small. So we have grown from there, and there are so many ponds I just I can't even start. I want to. I love them. We've grown so much. Um, we actually now, I love this picture, that is um, a leaf that we grew in our greenhouse, and I say we. There's a, a young woman behind that leaf who's at the time 19 years old, and it was um, rhubarb. She turned that rhubarb leaf into a bird feeder. So she bought one of those bags of concrete, mixed it, laid it in the leaf, and turned it into a bird feeder, and it sits in her yard at home now. Um, because she couldn't believe it. Just couldn't believe her, her good fortune that we had been able to grow something so amazing. Um, we started out, like I said, with the farmer's market. We had a community garden. The community garden is four acres. We plant maybe an acre of it. This year we have plans for six mound gardens, which is a traditional way of growing food for us. Um, but we also have plots for families to use so that they can have access to their own. One of the things that we've discovered is having local food was not really enough. How many people know what it's like or understand the food bank process? You get food, someone gives it to you, right? Which is a great concept. When you're in need or when you don't have enough, that's a perfect alternative. The reality for us is 12,000 square feet is what we have in our greenhouse. That's what's available to us to grow food. If we were growing for production, that would actually only be enough space for us to do maybe two crops of two different vegetables. I love tomatoes and I love cucumbers, but I don't just want to eat tomatoes and cucumbers. So what we did was we took our greenhouse and we turned it into an education center as well. So we grow some plants specifically to have seeds to give to garden spaces. And some of it we grow greens for people to eat and access year round. So we have what's called a salad in a bag program. You purchase the most expensive bag ever. Um, $3 for a grocery bag, set of five cents. But for your $3, you can fill it with whatever you want from the greenhouse that's growing. So we have usually, I would say, four or five boxes of kale growing, three or four kinds of lettuce. We do tomatoes, cucumbers, Swiss chard, rainbow chard, the tiny millions, sweet millions they're called. They're little tiny uh, cherry tomatoes that are, for whatever reason, in our greenhouse, exceptionally sweet. It's like candy. Um, a little bit of everything. We have beets, radishes right now. Uh, we've done Jerusalem artichokes, sunchokes they're called. Um, and they can be grown. Looks like a sunflower, but you actually eat the root. And it's an alternative to a potato. A lot of the stuff that we talk about and the things that we do are bearing in mind that in our community, A, there are food insecurity issues, but B, there are real issues that are social issues for us Disconnection to our culture and our land being one of them, partly because of the reserve system, um, partly because of generational trauma, residential schools, because the residential school is literally, again, same as the grocery store, it's actually about 25 minutes from the reserve. So for us, we really have to be mindful of the fact that one of the things that we're teaching by offering people the opportunity to grow things is how to be in touch with themselves in their space as a person. Because 
and it's fun, I was explaining earlier, my mom is the face of our greenhouse, the face of our program in our community. If you have a question, she actually had uh, articles in the paper. Ask Kitty. She has a column about gardening and about food, how to grow it, how to preserve it, how to cook it. Um, but when it comes to talking to people on a large scale about what that means for us as a community, it tends to be me, and I, I'm going to say apparently that's partly due to Deb telling people you should go talk to you. Um, but for me, that's the exciting part because what happens is we do all of these things every day. There are workshops going on right now. I think we're doing six a week. And it runs as a six-week series for children. So we actually do what we call the little green thumbs. And over the course of six weeks, they learn what it looks like in their yard, what to do with the soil, how to start their seeds, where to plant them, and how to care for them. So that they go home and they can grow a garden. So that they can know where their food comes from. The classes started originally because my mom was talking to a group of immersion students and they were all learning their language, learning their culture, but they came to the greenhouse for gym class because they didn't have space for a gym. So as an alternative school, they only had classrooms. So they came to the greenhouse and mom was explaining to them she was planting for the springtime and all of the students stopped what they were doing, came over to her, watched and they stood one in a line and they sang a seed song, which is a cultural song, to the seeds that she was planting so that they would know it was time for them to grow. And my mom, is, she was weepy. She still gets weepy when she talks about it. Because it was so moving to see these children just knowing what to do at that time because it was the right time. It was the right thing for them. And it was the right thing for the seeds. So they sang the song, they planted the plants, and she said to them, do you know why we're doing this? There's stuff growing everywhere, isn't it evident? You're growing stuff. So she said, well, do you know where your food comes from? Now, if you asked a, let's say, seven-year-old where their food comes from, where do you think they're going to tell you? The grocery store. The grocery store. They're like, theirs. <laughs> no frills. Looking at her like, she's crazy. And she said, when you have kids of your own, if you don't know where your food comes from now, you won't have food because they're not going to know where it comes from. And every one of them was like, oh, I'm not having kids, that's gross. <laughs> Seven years old, they're like, whoa, whoa, you are barking up the wrong tree, lady. This is not okay. Every teacher in the room is like, so she asked them, where do your seeds come from? I don't know. My mom doesn't plant that stuff. We don't do that here. That group of, I think there were 15 kids in that class. At the end of that season of gym <coughs> class, we had seven families come back to us, and I'll do it because I can't help myself, with parents like this, being towed by their children. And they're all like, um, they said that we could grow a garden. I'm like, did someone tell you you couldn't? <laughs> what, what is happening? No, 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 they, they told me we're going to grow a garden. Cool, congratulations. No, no, we, we're we going to grow a garden at home. Still, I'm, I'm lost. I, I'm not sure exactly what's happening. What, what's the problem with that? I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and my mom, true to form, was like, don't worry, they do. <laughs> yeah, but what are we going to do? Like, what are we? Again, you're asking the wrong person, actually. Talk to your child. What happens if everything dies? And I was like, step over here. Guys, go pick out your plants. The kids are over there. They're like, I want some of this. I want some of this. I want some of this. My parents are like, you're just letting them pick stuff. Like, what are they going to do? My mom said, they're going to take you home. They're going to show you where to put the garden. And then you're going to plant it. What happens if we kill it? What did they tell you? They told me if anything went wrong, I could text Miss Kitty and she'd be fine. <laughs> my mom said, do you want my phone number? If we could do that, it would be great. The number of people who have my mom's cell phone, I don't even know. She gets calls from people all the time. She, like the middle of a Sunday afternoon. If I have a plant that looks like this, a little picture comes up. What is this? Is this a weed? Seven kids. All the difference in the world. The next year, 
Those same seven kids came back, brought their siblings and their aunties. The next year, I would say probably about 25. Still the same seven kids. They don't even come back anymore. They're like, we have seats from last year. We started the next house. They built confidence in their parents, not in themselves. They already believed they could do it because they'd done it once at the greenhouse. But their parents believed them after the first year. One of the things that we found was that you have to convince parents and adults much harder than you do young people. Because if you give them stuff, if you guys went home today and were like, I don't have a yard to speak of, but I have a patio planter, and you want to put peppers in like that, or tomatoes, you don't need very big space or pot, a little bit of water, the amount of sunshine that you might get here on the patio. You can actually grow your own garden. It doesn't need to be huge. So we started teaching people. You can have a patio planter. You can have a raised bed. You can go to the community garden if you want to. But the adults are the ones that are taking the most time to become confident in it. So those are at the Jerusalem artichokes, actually, that picture. Um, it looks like the weirdest little strange potatoes roots. But it makes something called inulin if you dry it. It's a really good fiber. It's very good for you. And it's low on the glycemic index, even though it is a starch. Um, which, when I say those things, I hear them coming out of my mouth, and I hear my mom. <laughs> And I'm, I'm always surprised. And I always tell people, so this might be recorded, but I'm never going to show it to her. Because what happens is I open my mouth, my mom comes out, and I'm like, shh, don't tell her. <laughs> How many people listen to their parents heartily? <laughs> yeah, guys, don't. Don't even pretend. I, I was like, no. I, I wanted to listen to my mom. She knows some stuff. I know she loves me. She cares for me. She has a good thought. But it wasn't until I was grown where every once in a while I would talk and it would be like, there's my mom, what is happening? And people would ask me things and I'd be in public and I would answer them about plants. Can I grow this here? Well, you could, but it's actually closer to something that would like shade. Or I have a shady area, how come mine won't grow? And I would be like, well, it's too shady, you're probably overwatering it. What is happening? <laughs> If you allow for that information to just come in, it's yours. If you start to question it or be like, oh, my mom's just, just telling me stuff. She always just wants me to do stuff. My parents are always telling me because they you know, love me and whatever. <clears throat> and that sounds funny, but the truth of the matter is when someone tells you something or when you go somewhere to learn something, what happens is you make the choice to become part of that relationship. So we are part of the relationship with our community because they wanted access to food, and we said, that's great. Here's some food now, take some greens home, come back and learn about where you can do that by yourself. Because we can't provide for everybody. And I know there's a whole adage about teaching a man to fish, or giving him a fish. But the same thing works with tomatoes and cucumbers. The same thing works with people understanding that knowledge is shareable, much like time is, because Spending a little bit of time here today, you can learn something that might spark something else in you that will take you much farther than you expect. Because I never thought that my favor to my cousin would turn into this. Standing at a farmer's market table selling produce where I was like, I had three customers the first day and two of them stayed in their car. They just pulled their car up to my table. I'm like, I just had a drive-by. <laughs> farmer's market. Now I'm thinking to myself, how can I make the farmer's market a drive-through or... Because now I'm looking for ways to expand. We have canning classes. We do poinsettia sales in the wintertime, usually as a fundraiser. We have a supplier for them because we have a lot of people in our community, again, because our community faces so many issues, who fundraise for things like um, cancer bike rides and diabetes awareness. So we offer those things as fundraisers. One of the things that this is, this is half the front quarter of our greenhouse, actually, this picture. So that's about, I would say, 44 by about 60 feet of an 84 by 144 foot, um, 144 foot greenhouse. We are part of a program called Healthy Roots, and it is a partnership between the Two World Times newspaper, which is a free paper, 
our program and the health services in our community. And what it is, is it started out as a challenge three years ago to four people to eat indigenous food only for 90 days. They chose a menu from Mesoamerica, only things that came from this part of the country were they eating. Because what we've determined and what we're looking at now is the fact that what we classify as the five white gifts, which are lard, dairy, flour, right? Those, those foods, those gifts from outside of our place, from outside of our country, are things that are actually hard on our bodies. They're hard for us to process. White sugar, there's a reason why our bodies don't actually want it. I mean, I say that, my body really wants sugar. <laughs> it's highly addicted to sugar. And I, I admit that because I struggle with it all the time. But one of the things that we've discovered is that when people participated in this, their bodies changed, but so did their mindset. Because the premise of Healthy Roots was in, incorporate physical activity and eat indigenous food. And they thought, okay, so I'm simple, right? I mean, people have heard of a diet, right? Like everyone's heard of there's a, every kind of diet on earth. There's, someone is always coming up with some sort of eating system. And it's not necessarily that it's a diet to lose weight or it's a diet for something. It's a, it's a diet, that's a way of eating. So what we did was we set up this challenge to be healthy culturally as well as physically. So that partnership has grown and we've done it now. We're in the third series. And part of that is actually a study that's happening on the physiological effects of someone who's doing that diet. Um, and it's a research study that's being done by McMaster University with health services. We have a community group who is doing the same thing, so we attempt to incorporate as many of those ideas as possible, eliminating those foods, um, eating whole food only, eating non-processed food, changing the way that we approach the world. So in our house, there's a lot of turkey happening right now because my mom is doing health <coughs> She's much more strict than I am because I still love coffee too much. Um, it's just one of those things. But what that partnership has created was another door for people to be able to come into the greenhouse and to come to our program and say, what is it that you do here? What's happening? Can I come to the farmer's market? Can I sell cookies? Is that allowed? You guys sell healthy food or you only grow vegetables. I'm like, well, if we grew a cookie tree, I'm sure we would always have one on hand. And it would be the most popular thing. People come all the time looking for bacon seeds, and I'm just like, <laughs> I really want a bacon seed so bad. But we're not there specifically for only because of the vegetables. We're there because it's about access. We're there because it's about now the connection of people. We have so many other things that are relevant to the community that don't really have anything to do with Vegetable. One of the things about our program that I love is the fact that we've created relationships for people, not just to our program or even to their culture, but to each other. Because people may meet there that never would have come across each other in that setting. So one of the things that we do is celebrate that fact because a lot of times one of the a lot of times the community listens to the words of something. So when I am looking at my research, and I know for myself that part of the part of the process is for me to understand that food sovereignty means something, and food security means something, and a food system is something. But the reality at work every day for people is that's not why they come. This is why they come. Those are the things that they are lacking, is that connection. And people assume that part of it is cultural, and it is. We've experienced loss on a generationally large level. But as well, we get caught up in things like, well, the word sovereignty is political. It, it means that you want to be separate from the government. Well, actually, it means that we want to be able to control what goes in our mouth. We want to be able to control what we put into our bodies. Some of that means what's happening in the environment and in climate. If it's too hot out or we're living in a smoggy city, I can't control what comes into my body. I, I can't stop that from happening. Two years ago? Four? Oh my goodness. I don't even know what year it is anymore. In 2013, I went to China for a month for, as part of my school traveling system. And for my master's. 
When I was there, the level of smog was about six times what it is here on a good day. And I just expected that it would be that way when I was going there. But I didn't really have any way to address how it would be when I got there. I was one of the only people, interestingly enough, while we were there that didn't get sick. Everyone else at some point got a cold, you know. I, on the other hand, was, I'm a big fan. I went out and got like a little duck bill face mask. I couldn't help myself. Partly because growing up in the greenhouse and living out west where there were so many trees and the oxygen was so rich where I had lived, I really am aware of the changes to myself when I am in the city for a long time. I lived in Toronto, actually. I lived about 20 minutes from here for about a year and a half. And while I was here, I didn't notice it. Every day I just was at work, I was at home, I did my thing, I wandered around. And then I would go home to my community and be like, I feel really good. I feel, what is going on? But when you're, when you're at school, you are busy, you're hectic, you have a lot of things happening. And when you go home, you have your weekends, you have your time away, you would just assume it's part of that separation of being not where your responsibility is. But part of it actually, if we think about it is, well, how many house plants did I have? <laughs> or I went home to my house where I have a 15 acre property that's covered in trees. Chances are good some of my feelings had to do with my environment. But I never put the two together at the time. It wasn't until as time has progressed. Now I think about it a lot when I invite people because we have staff meetings, for example, for different organizations in our greenhouse. This was actually a tour. Um, a community group came from actually all over the GTA, different tourist associations. And one of the things that they commented was, so the air is so rich here. And I was just like, I don't know, it's like, it's thick. To me, the greenhouse feels like a sauna. You know when you step into a sauna and the air is like heavy, it's touching you? That's me when I'm in the greenhouse, but it's because the air, A, is very oxygenated and B, is very rich because it's warm as well. One of the things that we've started to do is to address people's desire for not local food, but literally local food. So this year we're putting in a food, a food forest as well as a, a market garden. So we're going to put about an acre to an acre and a half of produce that we grow right on site. It's practical for us because we know where it comes from then and what goes on to it. Because in our greenhouse, we don't use things like miracle Grow. If we have bugs or we have problems with pests, my mom makes pest remover. Um, we use soap and water. We use different things like that. We had a really bad case of, and I, this just sounds, it sounds awesome. We, we had a bad case of potato bugs. You know little bugs that roll up look like a basketball? Did you know that if you want to get rid of those and you have them in abundance, what you can do is ferment them? I didn't know. I don't, didn't want to know, actually, but there, there I was, without a luck, um, my mom gathering up potato bugs from a, a, one of our boxes, put it in a jug with water for about 28 days, and then she took just like the smallest amounts of it out and mixed it with water and would water the boxes. And I, I said, I give up. Tell me what you're doing with smelly water. What are you doing? First of all, why does it smell like death in here? <laughs> and uh, she said, well, think about it. I said, oh, I, I have a fair notion. I'm pretty sure I understand it. But I want to know. Tell me what the reason is. There's got to be a science-y reason to this. She said, okay, it's not just magic. She said, how many people really want to stay where there's been genocide? <laughs> I'm like, oh, that sounds terrible. She's like, I know. And I normally would be a fan of genocide, but in this case, the deal is the bugs know they have a certain place they're supposed to be. They're not supposed to eat what is ours. Hmm. Genocide. I like this. So the bugs actually became the pesticide that we use. We have done it with more than one bug. We have a few different things that we do. But the, the methods that we have to control those things in our greenhouse, uh, that is not pests. That's roses. Um, the methods that we use are actually organic practices. They're traditionally usable, treatable things that allow for our plants and our food to grow so that we don't have to A, 
purchase something that is a chemical, B, have a chemical that we need to wash off of our food or that gets into it. So the largest portion of our program, and I say the large portion, the largest portion of our program I feel like is our greenhouse and our education. The reality, if I list them, is we have the farmer's market, which was the start, our community garden, which this is a picture, um, some volunteers in our community garden. We have the Good Food Box, which is a once monthly program. It's a national organization. Um, most, most cities have one. Um, and it is a monthly access to fresh fruits and vegetables. We have the education portion, which carries over into our greenhouse. We now have the food forest. We have an apiary, beehives, in case anyone's wondering. Um, and we also have our apothecary. So that's actually a picture of some tobacco plants. One of the things that we carry in our greenhouse is traditional medicines for our community members. That is a cultural agreement that we have. We grow them, partly because I don't think there's anything really my mom can't grow, um, but partly because it's a space that is neutral for the community to be able to access them. Because of the history of the reserve and because of the history that we face as Indigenous people, there are a lot of people Oh, wait. Yeah, that's graffiti, but it's okay. They were allowed. Um, our communities faced things like <clears throat> religious intent, hoping that we would maintain their religion when the residential schools were forcing our education upon us. So, in our community, there are traditional people, and I use the traditional in the sense of there are people who believe in the Longhouse cultural traditions, and that's how they live. There are some people who attend church. There are a very large number of churches in our community, um, and they're beautiful. They are well attended. Some of them are very busy. Um, and then there are people in our community who choose neither of those things for their own reasons. One of the beliefs in our community and one of the beliefs in our program is that we don't want anyone to feel like they're not part of what we're going to do. Because regardless of whether or not you go to Longhouse, or to church, or you don't go anywhere, or you drink on Saturday night, or you don't drink on Sunday morning, those things don't matter to us. Because who you are is who you are. And the belief that we hold is that our space is for everyone. Because everybody here needs water, everybody here needs food. And everyone deserves that right. So if you can learn to do it on your own, then that's great. If you don't know and you need some help, that's what we're there for. It's for everyone. What we strive for is so that people like Theodore will grow up knowing that his traditions culturally are practiced by his mother day to day. His mom is the one who was holding the giant leaf. Um, she was just barely 18 when she started, and he's just over a year now. So it's been a few years. This is actually a bee extracting honey. They are extracting honey from hives right now on frames. We sell honey, it's one of the things that we have available as well. It's an alternative, again, like syrup, we have connected with people who have sugar bush. Um, it's an alternative to processed sugar. So for us, these are all parts and pieces of our program. That's a picture of our community garden. Um, I, I put things up there because I didn't want people to be reading about our program. If you want to read about our program, you can go to our website. You can email me and ask me to list things about the program. That's completely okay. What I wanted people to see here today was, I want you to see the program. I want you to see what's happening here. Because most of the things that you've seen today are the connection. You're actually getting to see that connection for people. There are things happening in every one of those images where a person is either being connected to the land, to another person, to the food that they're going to put in their body, or to themselves in a way that they didn't realize was perhaps missing. So when I did my master's, there's a picture and it came up early, and it's a picture of scarlet runner beans, and they're pink and purple, white, black, and they're beautiful. But what happened was I asked, one of my staff said, why did you take that picture? She said, well, I believe, and I grew up going to Longhouse, and the calendar culturally tells me 
that we plant and we live by what the earth is doing. She said, and I, I understood that. But what I never knew was that it was so beautiful. That one thing could be so many things in one. That one bean looked so different. They all came from two or three pods, but there were five colors in her hand. She's like, I had no idea that this could be so beautiful and I could plant it for the future or I could eat it for today, but it's mine and I know where it came from. She said, that's why I'm here. When I ask her about it now, she's like, I don't know what you're <laughs> Because people don't, and, and we don't, and I laughed, I said this actually to Megan when I got here, I don't very often think about what I do on a day-to-day -day basis as a connection to anything other than I have stuff to do, I've got papers to do, I have, you know, reports to write, I have invoices to do, I have lots of stuff to do. But the reality every day of our program is these connections. The environment that we live in is colored by how we see it, not just we are colored by it. The reserve itself is one of the few areas left that has Carolinian forest, which is a mix of different kinds of trees, all growing together. And it's so large still, you can see it from space. That doesn't happen anywhere anymore. There's so much agricultural land across the world now, and so much city space. Those are the things that color what they see, what you can see from high up. When you fly in a plane and you look out the window and you can get close enough to see the earth coming towards you, what do you see? I see big squares. I see squares and depending on where you're traveling, you also then see big squares, small squares, and swimming pools, right? You're looking out the window, depending on the town you're going, if you're going up north, you're not seeing swimming, you're going to see little lakes everywhere. But that's the reality of it. Those are usually the things you see. And in our community, if the forest is something that you can still see from high up, that's incredible. That's another one of those questions of what, what is it doing to my insides to be able to have access to that much. When we plan for the garden, our community garden is one of the, one of the few that I know. You don't have to participate in the planting and the care for and all of those things in order to take the food. Ordinarily, there's a reciprocal relationship that must occur and people have a difficulty with that, and we talk about that a lot because our community garden is one of the few places and probably the only place that I ever know of where we advocate you know, minor theft. I, I went to a, a talk once in Milton, and there was a man sitting in the front row, and he said, I need to know how it is that you hope to um, curb theft. Curb theft? Sorry? He said, your job is, what, like risk analysis? <laughs> I, uh, yes, I'm the lawyer. I'm like, okay. So let me just explain this to you, and I'll, I'll do it slowly so that you really understand it, and I'll explain it two times, because I know that the first time you're not going to believe me. We hope they steal it. It's like, no, no. Say that again. I'm like, I didn't say I would say it twice. I promised I would say it two times. We tell you if it's ripe and it's ready and you'll take it, if you will use it, please take the food that we plant. So we plant cabbage, we plant tomatoes, we plant cucumbers, we plant peppers, we plant hot peppers, we plant broccoli and Brussels sprouts, though I don't know why. <laughs> we plant kale, we plant lettuce and radishes and carrots. And what we strive for is to lose all of our produce. Every day we go in and we hope that there's like a big bear patch. We planted uh, zucchini once. And if you've ever grown zucchini or know someone who grows zucchini, once it starts, you really have to keep your eye on it. My mom is notorious for having zucchini and she'll like you go out every day because they start out, they're nice and they're, you know, attractive and they're little and you can make zucchini bread, you can spiralize them out. There's like a thousand things you can do with zucchini. But if you forget one or you lose it in the green, the green my mom came to me, she's like, I got, I got rid of all the zucchini. I'm like, what did you do, go door to door? 
Yes. She said, but I missed one. Will you take it home with you? And I was living in Toronto at the time. So we hadn't even started the program yet. This was just in her home garden. And uh, I'm like, I, yeah, okay, sure. I'll, it's a zucchini, what, what could it hurt? It was this long. <laughs> it was this big around. I know where to lie. I cut it up. I squeezed out as much of the juice as I could. I froze them in one cup increments and I split it with my neighbor. So we each got nine cups of zucchini. <laughs> I'm like, Mom, what, what are we doing, Mom? So when the time came and the program started and we got access to the greenhouse, I said to her, hey, Mom, you should apply for this job. She's like, well, doing what? I'm like, well, you're just growing stuff. It'd be great. It's only a one-year contract. It's in 2013. Every so often she looks at me now and she's like, it's a one-year contract. Just growing some stuff. Like, yeah, just one time, just a little bit. But one of the things that I'm the most proud of in terms of the program is the fact that the way that I grew up is not being lost on people. The fact that I ate whole food only for the first 10 years of my life, there are now people in my community who will experience that to some degree because of the time that they spend with us because they get to see things that we do every day. Sometimes it rubs off. Sometimes it's a bit of a forced thing. We did a, a kids day once, and we had, again, another group of immersion students come in. And it was their last day. They'd been coming for six weeks. And I said, you know, let's, let's have a pizza party. I'm okay with that. We'll make pizza dough. It takes like six minutes. The stipulation was, they had to have three things on it from the greenhouse before they could have pepperoni. Green peppers were popular. One group of boys were sure that they would love habanero peppers. <laughs> Anybody love habanero peppers? I do. On pizza, not so much. The three million mark on the Scoville scale where your tongue is like melting, not gonna happen. We came to a, an agreement, they used green peppers and a little tiny bit of jalapeno. About three weeks later, we're walking through the grocery store. And these are the things that happen when you make a connection with someone that you may not know. Walking through the grocery store with my mom, which is kind of a rarity for us really, because I mean, we don't really need a lot of things in the grocery store. Some woman walks up to my mom, and I just assume everyone's going to talk to her because that's just how she's always been. And this woman walks up and hugs my mom. Here we go again. And uh, my mom sort of got this look on her face, and the lady thanked her and kept going. I'm like, what was that about? She said, oh, she was just telling me she had pizza last night. Like, oh, yeah. Well, she had, like, tomatoes and green peppers and mushrooms on it. Great. I wasn't sure what I would, like, should I high five this woman for having a pizza? And she said to me, her son was the one who wouldn't eat anything but pepperoni. And for the last six weeks, because they have pizza every Friday, it's their family night, they have green peppers and mushrooms and tomatoes. And she hadn't had that since he was born. He's seven. And she was like, I just, I'm, I love pizza all over again. And then she's like, I mean, I know I shouldn't eat here. And then my mom's like, it's not about junk food. That's not what this is about. She's like, no, but my boy picks what we put on it. When I hear things like that, I think about the fact that coming to today, listening to, listen to me ramble. The number of things that you will learn in your life from, uh, I'll warn you guys now, from your parents, sorry. It's gonna sneak out one day, you're gonna be like, all that time. They might have known something, but don't worry, I won't tell them that you know, and I won't tell them that you listen. Because I very often tease my mom, I'm like, oh, I didn't hear that. I heard that with my bad ear. <laughs> but those connections and those things that we learn when we're young are the things that we 
will be able to share with someone in a way that they may understand later. Because if you can connect someone to where they live or their place or their food, you can really change how they see the world. Because it's something that we all need. But it's also something we can all share. Thank you for coming.